Hey, we're Evan and Jenny Owens, founders of Reboot Recovery. We're really excited that you have joined us for session one of The Great Cover Up. The church should be a place where people find help and healing, but some spiritual leaders take advantage of people's trust. And instead of helping people, they end up hurting them. Wow. By creating cultures of manipulation, control, and secrecy, some leaders inflict soul wounds that can literally have eternal impact. Mm -hmm. And today is part one of our four-part series on the subject of spiritual abuse. And this topic isn't limited to crazy cults or chart-topping podcasts and documentaries. Spiritual abuse is something that can touch us all, and we just can't cover it up. So let's get started. In recent years, the subject of spiritual abuse seems to sort of have come to the forefront and made headlines as high profile leaders in the faith have not only fallen from grace, but have deeply hurt a lot of people in the process. And we've read stories of these cover-ups where people surrounding these leaders even covered up what was going on. They knew about it. They didn't expose it and they didn't confront the leader. There's been chart topping podcasts. I mean, all sorts of things where people are sweeping things under the rug. They're covering them up, leaving some of us to even question the ethics of what does it mean to sort of be a Christian leader all together. And we've seen this topic, like I mentioned, on major Hulu documentaries and big time Spotify podcasts. And so a lot of us are sort of tuned into this being a reality. We we see this. But you see, these are just the stories that are publicized. But in fact, there's a lot of other examples of spiritual abuse, some of those in which Jenny and I are going to talk about over the course of the next few sessions. And today we're going to begin that process of sort of looking under the rug, of uncovering the thing and dealing with what's found underneath. I'm Evan. This is my wife, Jenny. We're the founders of Reboot Recovery, and we are really glad that you've chosen to join us for a series on a topic that, let's be honest, it's just not easy to discuss. And so one of the things that we've chose to do is rather than just dive into the teaching every time right away, we're going to begin each one of these series by letting you in on a conversation we had with a dear friend of ours who had a front row seat to an abusive spiritual movement. And she's going to kind of share what her personal experience was from deep in the inside of this, from a person who went from feeling very supported and loved to a person who realized they were in sort of a, a very abusive situation. And each session is going to start with just a little bit of that conversation, and then we'll dive in to some teaching. So let's go to that conversation right now. Today, we are super blessed to have one of our dear, dear friends, one of our favorite people in the world. Lara Izakadis is here with us, and she is a rock star in all things. She's an author. She's led ministry around the world. She's lived with Jenny and I for a season of time, and basically there's like Aunt Lara around our house. And so it is very special to have her with us. Thank you so much for being here. How are you guys? I'm so privileged to be here. I love you all. Well, yeah, she she sadly moved recently away from Tennessee down to Atlanta. And um, ever since then, basically, Jenny and I have had to parent alone, which is just <laughs> devastating. No more Auntie Lara. Yeah, we lost our third. We lost. Now we're, now we're in like zone coverage all the time. It was man to man for a little while there, you know. And so this subject of spiritual abuse, before we get into that, just for our people who are tuning in, who are watching this, let's just give a little bit of background, right? Because I think your story of kind of coming to faith is actually really neat, right? Because you had a lot of things going on. You had a lot of successes, even as a young person in high school and going into college. So why don't you tell me a little bit about sort of your upbringing and sort of um, your family lineage and what brought you to the place where you finally accepted Jesus. And kind of share a little bit of that story with us. Yeah, my upbringing was a little bit unique in the start of it, which I'll share more about some some influence of the a trauma community, mm-hmm. I guess. Say. I um, was was raised in an immigrant community in the south side of Chicago. My parents are both from Lithuania, and so we had, um, there was five girls in my family, well, plus my mom, six of us, mm-hmm. that's a lot for my pops, and so we um, we just had this unique situation where we were in a community of, of essentially immigrants, both half our school is Hispanic and immigrants, and half is Lithuanian immigrants, and um, we... Um, essentially were raised in a religious um, environment as far as uh, you go to church on Sunday, Catholic background. Um, But I didn't really have any idea of 
who Christ was until I got to my um, freshman year in college, where I was first introduced to the gospel after having an, an injury. I, was a, I played volleyball for Kansas Jayhawks, and that was my life, my world. But she's not a fan at all. So no, don't, never. Don't, you yeah. won't ever catch me seeing yeah, exactly. <laughs> wearing a hat or a bumper sticker or anything like that. Yeah. Um, Rock Chuck Jayhawk. Anyways, <laughs> I have to put that in for all my KU fans. Yeah, so that's basically I was introduced at a, a very a very low part in my life um, to the gospel, and I'm so grateful for it. Yeah, yeah. And so you were in college when you first encountered the gospel in a fresh way, right? Yeah. And so you were, and you were reached on the college campus. Yeah. Tell me about that experience. You know, it was quite miraculous. So despite anything that you might hear me say, I, I want to make sure to say I'm very grateful for those who you know, just gave of their life to share the gospel with me because it is the most important thing that has ever happened to me. And I was um, at a really low point, essentially, with my, um, I had an injury, just short enough time to get my attention. And I had been asking God, if you're real, if you're out there, then, you know, please send somebody to help me. And, And soon after, I had encountered some Christian um, a group of Christians who essentially um, were outside my dorm wanting to share the gospel with people. And I had never been encountered with the gospel. And of course, I had this private conversation about like, God, if you're real, send me someone to help me. And they basically just, um, I would say, loved me to Christ. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's interesting. I think some of us who grew up in the faith, We don't necessarily know what it is that's so attractive about it when we first hear it. It's easy to forget. So, you know, one more question, and then Jenny, I'll let you dive in there. I guess one of my questions would be, you know, you mentioned they were ready to love you to faith. They were what were what were some of the things that drew you into this community of faith, into this this Jesus thing that was going on? What were some of the attributes, I guess, that kind of hooked you at first? I think it's 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 the same thing that is still the true gospel within every spiritual family church culture that is healthy. It's the thing that God created for us. So it would just love and a sense of community and belonging. And that's the thing to be said, even as we move forward to understand that those things are still true and good and they are available. And they're, they're things that, you know, and God did create us to be in a family spiritual family and community. And so even as I share with my journey, there's there, it's not, there was a journey there, but it's still God's heart to put us in family. It's still God's heart to, to be in a community of belonging and love. And so the love is what, what drew me to this, to, to these people because they loved me. They cared for me. And in a world where there isn't, there wasn't that love. I had experienced, mm. I was a part of the volleyball team. I'd been a part of community in a sense without God all my life because I started playing sports when I was young. So you have community, you, but a community without Christ, I mean, it, there's great things that happen from community. For me, I had community in volleyball teams and different things, but there was the thing that glued us together was the love of God. And so that was mm. definitely what. Um, wow. was really strong and and threaded through. So, so um, I don't know the exact timeline. So you mentioned kind of building up the foundations and receiving Jesus. Um, but fast forward, at some point, things changed, and maybe you began experiencing some signs that not everything was quite right mm-hmm. or maybe some red flags. I don't know if it was in that movement or in something else that you got to be a part of, but what were some of the first signs that you noticed later that something was a little bit off? Uh, without a doubt, the control. Control is a um, a very strong part of uh, in a spiritually abusive environment. Um, you... And, and, and again, the culture, you mentioned about culture, and that's a really key word in spiritual abuse, because for me, in where, where the faith movement I was a part of, the culture, when it first started, was healthy. There was, a, there was so much of it that was healthy. They were, they were 
preaching the gospel. They were discipling, which is essentially, you know, that's the training as a Christian, you move forward and get coached. There was coaching spiritually. That stuff is still a part of growing strong in your walk with Christ. So just to be clear, you, when you want to grow in Christ, you're going to have, just as an athlete, you're going to have some tough stuff. You're going to have your spiritual coaches in Mm -hmm. your life going like, Hey, you know, there, it'll be some tough love. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's not something we need to get rid of. Mm -hmm. That's not spiritually abusive. That's good. What is, what, what becomes, what began for me was the, there was, like I said, the controlling, there was a lot of, um, critique on my life and there was just a consistent um contact with me through the leaders Mm. there just was too much involvement in my decisions and how i move forward and there was even um the culture itself started to get toxic in a sense where when things get in just like if you have a a, a well of water and you get something in there that's polluting it mm-hmm. mm. and you start drink feeding the people the polluted water mm. wow. you started drinking that water and like ah, you think you're still drinking the original water that you you started drinking mm, originally yeah. yeah but then you're like mm, but this one's making me a little sick or i'm a little more anxious i was afraid like one of the other things i remember is like i was i started dreading getting fo- looking at my phone mm. because i consistently get a call after something from the leaders it's one or the the leaders of saying of critiquing me in some way yeah. or saying so and so came to me and said this about you or so and so and why are you doing this and what about this and just very um confusing and you just began to walk on eggshells mm. consistently about it so there wasn't this freedom like leadership in, in in the Bible talks about using persuasion to decisions or like, I mean, there's so many things about leadership, but this one specific scripture. So you can persuade people to something in your, in how you're sure. leading, but to, to use coercion or to threaten or to make you feel like you're, um, you don't measure up or you're, there's just a lot of things that start wow. getting involved yeah. in your, but because you want to belong, yeah. Because the community, because even like with gang culture, yeah, it's you know there's there's that belonging, there's a sense of connecting and love. So it's like it's not just so clear cut. Like oh, this is happening. I think it's interesting that you highlighted the anxiety because I feel like sometimes that's evidence of what we might use as a phrase of cognitive dissonance, where it means you want to believe this. And because you've kind of put you've st- you've put yourself in this place of saying I'm, I'm aligning with this, but yet there's some part of you that's saying this doesn't feel quite right. Yes. So then you're warring with yourself to say, don't trust your instincts. Yes. Put put that down and focus on this thing, this decision that you've made. But that constant rub doesn't go away, and I think that does cause you to self doubt, yeah. to self criticize, and to be, like I said, anxious about your decision makings because you're not sure what ramifications are going to happen. Ramifications. Right. And you don't have a safe place essentially to bring up concern about, and that was the the secrecy that you were saying and, or the protection of the leaders. Like you, a lot of things when it started, you know, there was movement, slow movement in the kind of the culture in this, within this kind of Mm. waters, little by little, there was corruption getting Mm -hmm. right. And it was unchecked and, and probably and unacknowledged because you could barely you tell. You cannot talk. You can barely tell. And there was a sense of covering. We later found out a bunch of things came out like just because we know the Bible says all things will be exposed. You will. But in the meantime, when people like me are in the midst of these, these cultures that are getting corrupted, essentially, you, you see how things were covered up because of a, um, that you can't go to someone mm-hmm. and if who's in higher leadership, the very people that are correcting us consistently, you couldn't go to them. Mm-hmm. And if, and then when they had each other covering up for each other. Yeah. And so it's, it's just that in the meantime, in that window, you find many of us that are probably watching and listening that are, 
there's, there's a sense of like you, it's confusion because you think you're still drinking the pure waters mm -hmm. and you know, like you said, the anxiety comes because you're like, mm, yeah. it's not pure anymore. There's, there's the discernment and then there's the treatment, but then you're like, well, what are my choices? Cause I'm a part of this huge community. This is all that I know. Welcome back to session one. And we want to let you know that we have created a free course on this subject that you can use for independent study or even in a small group. It's totally free and you can access it just by going to your app store and downloading the My Reboot app. Then inside the app, you can find the course called The Great Cover Up and use it to create discussion with your friends or to more fully absorb and interact with each lesson. All right, so to start, in order to discuss this topic of spiritual abuse, we really need to define what it is that we're talking about. And Evan and I love Dr. Lisa Oakley's definition. She says that spiritual abuse is a form of emotional and psychological abuse, and it's characterized by a systematic pattern of coercive and controlling behavior within a religious context. Now, as Evan said, this topic is pretty close to us. We've personally personally known a lot of people who have been deeply traumatized by Christian leaders who they trusted within spiritual leadership. And sadly, we've had a front row seat to see the way that manipulation, false guilt, shame, fear, deceit have been wielded as weapons by church abusers. Right. Uh, we've had friends who were sexually molested by clergy for years who are still waiting for justice to be served. We've lived with folks who were taught a dogma of submitting to spiritual authority that resulted in self-neglect, burnout, tons of anxiety, a near total loss of confidence, and even chronic physical illness. That's right. right. Trauma can lead to chronic physical illness. We've known families who were told that they'd receive a tenfold return if they gave financial gifts until it hurt, only to end up bankrupt while the pastor walked around in $1,200 sneakers. We call those uh, preacher sneakers. That's right. That's, That's what we call those. Now. Yep. Uh, we've gone to church with folks who had been manipulated previously through so-called prophetic words from the Lord that resulted in overcommitment, sometimes disappointment. We get contacted by people all the time wanting help for their trauma, who explain that they've had church trauma, but they're hesitant to plug into a reboot course because a lot of our reboot courses are affiliated with a church. So that's actually been a bit of a hindrance, and it's something yep. that we really want to address because... We want to make this healing available to anyone, regardless of the source of their trauma. So good. So please make no mistake. Evan and I are not eager to bring any negative attention to the church. We love the church. Absolutely. We fully believe in the church. And we don't want to cause um, suspicion of everyone who's a church leader. But we feel that we have a duty to address trauma, regardless of its source. And even though we'd rather not discuss this topic... The wounds left by spiritual leaders are deep and can literally have eternal ramifications. Mm. So we don't feel like we have any other choice than to expose it and deal with whatever is being covered up. That's right. I mean, even when we began discussing what is the next series that we should do, you know, at this point, obviously the Mars Hill podcast has been a nationwide phenomenon and things of this nature. And so many people are talking about the subject of spiritual abuse, but there's this interesting thing that we love to see other people fail. We love to see other people in these epic kind of, you know, glory to, to doom kind of scenarios. And it's almost like a, like, you know, we, we, we say, well, thank God that's not me. But I think for a lot of us, what happens is we get into these communities and suddenly we realize, oh, wait a minute, maybe, maybe I'm in an abusive situation. And so I want to begin by disproving a really common belief. And I've ran into this and bluntly, Jenny, I've been a person who said this, which is this idea that only dumb or naive people end up in spiritually abusive situations. Only people who are who are not thinking clearly end up in some type of cult-like environment. And let me tell you, that simply is not true. A lot of brilliant minds have ended up mm -hmm. in spiritually abusive, emotionally abusive situations, right? There's the sense that most of us have that we're too wise, we're too discerning, we're too self-assured to ever fall victim to the lies of a spiritual abuser. But here's the thing. None of us willingly or knowingly purposefully joins an abusive community. It's not like we say, man, there's abuse over there. I should go get plugged in, right? right? None of us do that, right? We want to be really clear that those who end up in these abusive situations, these abusive churches, aren't really any different from us. They just happen to meet the wrong person 
usually at a moment of vulnerability, Mm -hmm. right? Think about it. Most of us came to faith or had this fresh awakening of our faith after realizing that there was some degree of brokenness in our life. We looked at our life and it wasn't fulfilling. We were lost. We needed a savior. We were desperately searching for hope. And when we came to know Jesus, we found it. I mean, do you remember the feeling that you had when you found him? If you were a Christian, I mean, think about how did you, how would you right now describe the feeling that you had? I remember it. The feeling that I had that I discovered, it was almost like I had found what everyone else was searching for. The joy, the fire hose of faith that flooded out out of me. And, And I wouldn't trade that for anything, because to find a higher understanding, uh, to find this understanding of fulfillment is truly one of the rarest sensations that we can experience as human beings. And these transformative moments are truly priceless. And when we find them, I remember thinking, why doesn't everybody just jump on the Jesus train? Like, this thing is so incredible. You know, I remember sharing it with almost everyone yeah. and wondering why wouldn't they want to experience this absolute fulfillment and joy? And this change isn't just inside of us, but it's also around us. Because when we come to faith, we're added to this new community, the family of fellow believers. And we lock arms with people who are on the same sort of a spiritual trajectory. They understand us and we understand them because we're all in on the secret. We all know the good news. We know something that the rest of the world is still searching for. We're special. We're valuable. We're called. We're chosen. We're set apart. And together, we believe we are changing the world, right? Yeah. And we are so grateful to the people who invited us to this newfound freedom. After all, we know where we'd be without them. Most of us, this is a term we use a lot in Reboot, we belonged before we believed. Mm -hmm. Good. Even before we may have believed the gospel message itself, we were most of us drawn in by a profound sense of belonging and community and by leaders who are usually pretty charismatic. I remember we had never met somebody like these folks. They were gifted. They, they spoke well, they worshiped, they prayed with an authority, the likes of which we had never encountered. And they made us feel special. Out of all the people in the world, they chose to invest time with us. And it in turn, they then invited us to go and invest in others, sharing what we learned and helping them discover what we had discovered. And just like this, the transformative good news of Jesus spreads. Is any of this sounding familiar to you? Did your story start off in a similar way? I know that mine did. You see, all spiritual abuse is born out of something that was initially good, but along the way it got corrupted. So good. Let's say that again. That's so good. All spiritual abuse is born out of something that was initially good, but along the way it got corrupted. And it starts with something that looks and sounds like what the church is meant to be, right? The word of God, which starts out pure and right, sometimes gets misinterpreted, twisted, taught with impure motives. Right. Um, where the Bible whispers about a topic, maybe an abusive leader begins to shout about it, giving undue weight to one scripture or another, or pulling it out of its larger context. That's that's a huge Uh, potential pitfall. And in doing so, followers begin to follow the teaching of a leader rather than the truth itself, right? We've all seen that. And slowly, a culture of spiritual abuse can emerge. But even as it's happening, we're usually unlikely to detect it. And here's why. The challenge with spiritual abuse is that it gets covered up for the sake of the larger mission, the greater good, if you will. It's the old We can't let one bad apple spoil the whole batch mindset, so we just brush it under the rug. Now, abusive leaders don't abuse 100% of the time, too. That's an important key thing to know. We talked about this with Lara. Between their abusive behaviors, there's loving, challenging, and life-enriching moments. And despite some subtle moments of abuse, their presence in our lives continues to bring out a redemptive quality. It brings out the good in us usually. And because of this, it's extremely difficult to reconcile the abuse we're seeing with the contradictory experience that tells us that our church is a good, safe place with good, safe people that are doing good things. We don't want anything, excuse me, we don't want to do anything that could jeopardize all the good that's being done, right? And it doesn't seem to be bothering anyone else, so we tend to just keep quiet and we minimize or excuse or even deny these red flags that we see altogether. And we start to say things like, well, that's just pastor being pastor. Or maybe we laugh off things that are certainly not funny. 
And let's suppose someone does step forward to confront the abuse. It's pretty likely that the leaders and the other members in the community are going to blame the victim, right? Everyone's going to wow. ostracize that person, that whistleblower. Situations where a leader, despite being guilty of abuse, blames or vilifies the accuser. That happens all the time. And then they call on their followers to stand on their side, resisting the evil and trying to stop the good and powerful work that's being done. And the church members rally around the abusive leader. And let me be clear, when we blame the victim, we support the abuser. It seems crazy, but it happens all the time. Wow. I love that. And, and maybe some of you who are with us right now are, are, have felt that, that sense of watching people who were your friends stand with the abuser, support the mm-hmm. abuser. And when we do that, we are blaming the victim. We are punishing the victim. Man, that's just that's a betrayal thing that actually is right. a part of moral injury. We talk about that in Reboot all the time. That's right. But that feeling of betrayal by a person that you trusted, whether it's the leader or some other person who maybe came into the movement with you but turned their back on you when you started to say things against the movement, mm-hmm. that's betrayal. And that's really, that, that causes a soul wound. That's why we're here talking about it. It's this. also a huge disincentive from addressing it. Because if you know, I'm just going to end up getting blamed for this anyway. Yeah. What's the point? So if, if you're watching this, like I hope that you're starting to see how this culture of abuse is so readily accessible, how it's easily fostered and supported, even by, get this, it's even supported by the people who are actually being abused. Yeah. Any one of us can get caught in the trap of an abusive community. And here's a spoiler alert for you. I said that word weird. Spoiler, that's a hard word for me to say today. A spoiler alert for you. It's probably happening in your church or faith community right now. Maybe it hasn't evolved into this culture of control or manipulation yet, but I'm betting that some of the key ingredients are already there. Because I can guarantee that as long as there are humans in leadership, the potential for spiritual abuse exists. A few years ago, I attended an event in Nashville. At the end of the event, they wanted to celebrate someone's birthday. They had this big cake. So I stepped to the table, stepped up to to get my cake because I love cake. Like if I could eat cake for all meals of the day, I would. I was very excited. But imagine my disappointment when I found out that the cake that they had made was actually sugar-free. This was a sugar-free cake for someone who dealt with a lot of blood sugar issues. Now, I get it for health reasons and all that, but I mean, come on, right? I mean, it's cake. Cake without sugar it's, ceases to be cake. It's, and it's, it's cake and it's frosting. I mean, these are two of God's greatest creations. On day number eight, this is what he made. On day <laughs> eight, he made day. cake. Ooh, that kind of rhymes. I'm a poet and didn't know it, right? So it, it, the thing about it is, is the cake looked one way, but it was actually something different altogether. It looked like a full sugar, straight up delicious cake. But when you bit into it, you see it lacked something that made it a true cake. It lacked the sugar. And modern churches led by spiritual, spiritually abusive leaders will often look and feel great at first. It'll seem like this wholesome Betty Crocker full sugar cake. They'll have powerful worship, great inspirational teaching, loving small groups, comfortable buildings, great children's programs, all this kind of stuff. And blinded by the lights and lulled by this beautiful worship music, it can be difficult to see the abusive culture being fostered around it. And that's why we have to remain vigilant. That's why we decided to address this topic head on, even though we recognize this is not an easy subject, especially for Christian people to talk about. It would have been easy to, to, write a, to, to teach on a hit piece on Christian leaders and to just tear them all down, but we're not doing it. We're, we're trying to say that these churches, which are full of loving people, often unwittingly morph into an abusive environment, and we hope to keep that from happening. And honestly... The genesis of this conversation came out of us talking about how can Reboot maintain, protect ourselves from becoming that kind of environment. That's I mean, we exactly want to look right. at this from the perspective of how do we be vigilant as a potential um, follower of, a, of an abusive movement, but also as leaders ourselves. So we want to, we're being introspective here and we're trying to ensure that we don't propagate anything that's abusive as well. That's exactly right. 
So again, we really thank you for joining us. And if you want to get the most out of our time together, please go and download the My Reboot mobile app in your app store. And then within the app, click on the course called The Great Cover Up. It's free. It'll give you some amazing discussion guide questions that you can use in a small group or by yourself. Just one thing I wanted to add to that, Jenny, sorry to interrupt you. I gave you like the pause finger. This is the official pause finger if you're watching the videos, is that if people don't like to use the mobile app, they can also just go to my.rebootrecovery.com and they can set up an account there and they'll be able to download a full workbook that they can print out and all that kind of stuff if they're more of a computer person. And there's other great stuff person. in there too. It's not just the great Ooh, cover-up. little little freebies. It's yeah. like the flowers on the cake that are like extra frosting, like bonus <laughs> frosting. Bonus. In the next episode, we will be digging into the mind of a spiritually abusive leader. Certainly, there are many different personalities and styles of abusers, so we won't be able to articulate them all. But there are, we found, some core mechanisms that abusers rely on to create these cultures of abuse. And by understanding these mechanisms and bringing them out into the light, we hope that we'll be able to detect abusive actions and deal with them before they mature and cause significant harm. That's good. Good stuff in the next one, and we really hope to see you there. Until next time, keep moving forward as we overcome trauma together.